Okay, we're on the move again, out in the old airport queue, so you know what might happen. I took a picture of the contrast that I want us to look at, and I want us to remember that when we're looking in the book of 2 Thessalonians, I'm not quite done with that yet. Uh, I know we ended the book as far as expository, but at one point in our time together, uh, we were not able to get everything done uh, because um, of technical difficulties. And this contrast between the Antichrist and Christ is very important because as we're looking at um, this warning that Paul gives, this exhortation, the mystery of iniquity doth already work. We have to appreciate what is being said here. So I'm going to start in 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and we're going to look at verse 3. Let no one deceive you in any way, for the day will not come unless the rebellion comes first. The man of lawlessness is revealed. Now, this is Paul's view of the Antichrist, and we're going to look at the personality of the Antichrist. It is important to understand this movement because he's telling us that this mystery of iniquity uh, doth already work. So notice it says, who opposes is revealed the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Do you not remember when I was still with you, I told you these things? So it's my responsibility to tell you these things. And let's also try to remember how that um, in the... Uh, uh, back in the, uh, d the time of the prophets, that given to us is the description of Satan himself. And you will see that this wicked one um, is the one who is opposing uh, God. And it, it begins this way, How are you fallen from heaven, O, star, o day star of dawn? And, oh, how, how you are cut down to the ground who, who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit in the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. All of those I wills. That's why he's described by Daniel as the willful king. I want you to understand that um, this is not just uh, a, a mimic of Christ. Now, he uses mimicry or a mere counterfeit Christ or a mere rival. Now, he is all of those things. I want you to understand this willful king's agenda he is the opposer. He is Satan. And he is opposing. And he is the God of, uh, he is the prince and the power of the air that worketh in the sons of disobedience. He is the one that, uh, is, that, that uh, is the head of the power of darkness or the kingdom of darkness. I want Christians, as Paul did in his day, to understand your enemy and that this mystery of iniquity, or as John states it, the spirit of Antichrist, it's already here. Let's not be naive. So I'm going to continue reading here for just a moment. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. Now that's a description of Lucifer, son of the morning, or as it, 
as the ESV says, O day star, son of dawn. He has an agenda. And understand that he also, and I, I will stand by this, he has a kingdom. Um, and he is doing everything he can to oppose God. And he will work in this world system to do so. And I think it's important that we understand that, uh, that we know where we are. Now, uh, let's look further in the book of Ezekiel 28. Uh, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, verse 11, Ezekiel 28, 11. I was in Isaiah 14, in case I didn't tell you that. Um, but I'm more, it's more important to listen to this for the moment. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, arise, a lam- raise a lamentation over the king of Tyre, and say unto him, Thus says the Lord, You were the signet of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Please, he... he uh, he he's not the um, uh, the emblem of the devil, the re- little red devil with the pitchfork and tail. He appears as an angel of light. Uh, deception is his game, and he is full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Uh, let's not have the Milton uh, uh, the the cartoon idea of Satan, please. Now, I don't want to deify Satan either. Uh, He cannot be everywhere present. He is not all-knowing. He certainly is not infinite. Uh, We know he's going to meet his end. Um, uh, Those things, uh, we will not deify him. But I will give you the spiritual content of him. And please be aware, you were in Eden, the garden of God. And I believe that's the garden that's in heaven. Uh, He was in the garden here on earth with Adam and Eve, too. That Eden. Very precious stone was your covering. Uh, Sardis, topaz, diamond, burl, onyx, uh, jasper, sapphire, emerald, and carbuncle. And crafted in gold were your settings and your engravings. On the day you were created, they were prepared. You were an anointed guardian cherub. I placed you. Uh, you were, were on the holy mountain of God in the midst of the stones of fire you walked. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till unrighteousness was found in you. And the abundance of your trade, you were filled with violence in your, in, in your midst and, and you sinned. I cast you as a profane thing from the mountain of God and I destroyed you, O guardian cher- cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was proud. Because of your beauty. Notice these, um, notice the characterization of this very powerful spiritual being. Um, By the multitude of your iniquities and the unrighteousness of your trade, you profaned your sanctuaries. I brought fire out from your midst, it, it consumed you. And I turned you to ashes on the earth in the sight of all who see you. All who know you among the peoples are appalled at you. You have come to a dreadful end, and there shall be no more forever. All right, I wanted to read that, and then I want us to compare that, if you will, in Second Thessalonians chapter 2 in what we just read. And when, uh, when Paul is warning these believers about the mystery of iniquity that doth already work. Um, This lawless one is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God. Not Not just the God of heaven, but every God. Or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Now, who does that remind you of? I don't think it's a wrong conclusion to say that the dragon, I believe, incarnates this Antichrist. And I I do believe that we can draw a safe conclusion on that from the book of Revelation. Uh, That voice that's speaking in Revelation um, is the voice of the dragon as it inhabits uh, and as this uh, Antichrist comes from the sea. 
uh, it says in chapter 13 of Revelation, And I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads, with ten diadems on its horns, and blasphemous name on its heads. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard, its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it the dragon gave his power and his throne. Did you know the dragon has a throne? The dragon has authority. The dragon has a realm. There is a kingdom of darkness. And we live among it. Let's understand that. That's what Paul was trying to tell the Ephesus um, church and the Asia Minor churches. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, spiritual wickedness in high places. The mystery of iniquity doth already work. Um, and notice further, one of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast, and they worshipped the dragon. Notice, they aren't worshipping the Antichrist. They're worshipping the dragon. For he had given his authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who's like the beast, and who can fight against him? So understand what Revelation is telling you. They are worshipping the dragon. Yes, they worshipped the Antichrist, but they're worshipping the dragon. And the beast was given a mouth, uh, uttering haughty and blasphemous words. That's always the characterization of wickedness. Haughty, arrogant, proud, blasphemous things. The mouth is running, you see. Uh, we see a lot of that promoted in social media uh, and in social television. And I have to say, I'm not too impressed with it. Um, and it goes on to say, It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming His name and His dwelling, that is, though who's, those who dwell in heaven. Also, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe and people, language, and nation. When do we else do we see that? Well, when the Lamb comes with, with, uh, for the redeemed. He's redeemed them by his blood out of what? Uh, every tribe, people, language, and nation. And all who dwell on the earth will worship it, even uh, everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to be taken captive to to captivity he goes if anyone is to be slain with the sword with the sword must he be slain here is a call for the endurance of faith of the saints all right now when we're looking at this in second thessalonians uh, i think we can draw uh, a safe conclusion when paul says the mystery of iniquity doth already work uh, this is the direct opposer and may I say that the practical application in our book, when the false epistles went out, when the false um, revel personal revelations were given by the opposers, the Judaizers, that they were working with the opposer. Uh, this, this person opposes God. He opposes the gospel. And he opposes the kingdom of light, and he opposes the believer personally. The mystery of iniquity doth already work. So I hope if we don't get anything done today, that we have and will exercise um, a clear idea of what was going on then with the Thessalonians and what's going on even so more today. So, number one, Christ came from above. Christ came from above. So teaches John. 
You remember they came to John, and they came trying to drive a wedge between Jesus. And notice, if you will, in John chapter uh, 6, and in verse 38, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Um, even more so, if you look in John chapter 3, when Jesus Christ is dealing with the, uh, when uh, Jesus Christ uh, is at the center of things, and the Judaizers, I'm sorry, the Pharisees, were trying to drive a wedge between John the Baptist and Jesus Christ. They were counting who baptized how many, when and where, and so forth. And notice, if you will, John answered, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it's given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I'm not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. Now, there you go. Now, there's the opposite characterization of the Antichrist. This is humility. This is giving place. Um, and notice, if you will, in verse 31, He who comes from above is above all. That's Jesus Christ. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. Jesus Christ is preeminent. Jesus Christ is preeminent. The Antichrist ascends from the pit. Look with me, if you will, in the book of Revelation, chapter 11. Revelation, chapter 11, and in verse 7. Revelation, chapter 11, verse 7. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that arises from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them, and their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city that symbolically is called Sodom and Egypt, where their Lord was crucified. This is about the two witnesses. Uh, there will be a gospel during the tribulation period of time. Uh, behold, the wrath of God has come, or repent, the wrath of God has come. That's the gospel of the tribulation. And these two witnesses are witnessing of Christ, and they will be killed in the street, uh, as you see here. That's, that's the movement of Satan. He comes from the pit. He kills God's saints. He makes war with the saints. He kills God's messengers. So understand that. Remember how the Judaizers had motivated the people in I Iconium. Uh, and Lystra, to stone Paul to death. Uh, they played on those people's ignorance and stirred them up. Uh, they had taken a vow, 40 of them, and shaved their heads that they would not eat until Paul was dead. Um, understand that there is a very real, not just spiritual, but physical opposition against the gospel against our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Christ came in his Father's name. Uh, look in the book of John, chapter 5, for just a moment. The book of John, chapter 5, and in verse 43. John, chapter 5, and in verse 43. I have come in my Father's name. And you do not receive me. If, in, if another comes in his own name, you will receive him. Uh, here Christ was trying to deal with these um, really apostate uh, leaders of, of Israel. Um, and uh, he was talking about John the Baptist first, that he was a burning light to the life of the Father. Uh, and here our Lord Jesus Christ said, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, 
and it is they that bear witness of me. But you refuse to come to me that you might have life. Um, that's Satan's movement. And may I say, one of the great tools that Satan uses is uh, the tool of religion. Uh, the tribulation is going to have a lot of religion, and it's going to be based on the dragon, the false prophet, and the Antichrist. There is even a, a opposition to the Trinity of God, and this is the Satanic Trinity. Um, now, the Antichrist comes in his own name. Um, if another comes in his own name, you will receive him. Christ humbled himself. Uh, there, It's important to mark character. Uh, it is not only the ability and the effectiveness of preaching and propagating the gospel, and that's all good and well, and the, and the gifts that go with it, but there must be a spiritual character noted. And that's something that is important to us as well. Christ humbled himself. Uh, our Lord came not seeking the high position, but took that of the lowest. And when we look in the book of Philippians chapter 2, and in verse 8, uh, I'm going to back up a little bit on this. Uh, have this mind among yourselves, verse 5, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but, was him, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, uh, being born in the likeness of man, kenosis, he emptied himself of all the physical glory. And he was enveloped in the form of servitude. Being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. Um, he came in humility. The Antichrist exalts himself. This self-exaltation. Beware of self-exaltation. Um, we know that our Lord spoke parables uh, concerning the pride and the self-exaltation of the self-righteous Pharisee. Uh, we know that from the parable uh, uh, concerning the tax collector and the Pharisee. Remember, there was a double application. Who left justified? The tax collector. Be merciful to me as, as you see the blood on the altar on the Day of Atonement. Um, he left justified. And then there's a warning against self-exaltation. Those that exalt themselves will be abased, and those that humble themselves will be exalted. Self-exaltation. And boy, that's rampant today. Christ is despised. He was despised and rejected. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. When he was on the cross, they mocked him and despised him. Uh, the Antichrist, as we read in Revelation 13, 3 and 4, he is admired by the multitudes. Uh, that's something that I want us to understand. And that's, I'm not saying all the mega churches are bad. I'm, I'm not going to say that. But it's very important we don't go along with the multitude. Uh, that can be a dangerous thing to do. Uh, this idea of equating things from a physical standpoint uh, to the spiritual. Well, they've got all these followers, that many people, it can't be wrong. They all can't be wrong. Yes, they can. The multitudes are going to follow this beast. Um, and notice it back in chapter 13 of Revelation. And they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority 
to the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, Who's like the beast? And who can fight against it? And the beast was given a mouth, uttering haughty, blasphemous words, and so forth. He is admired. Our Lord was despised. Um, so it's important that we look at this, self-exaltation. Uh, Christ will later be exalted in heaven by the Father. Uh, the Antichrist will be cast down. And we read that in Isaiah 14, 14. Uh, How art thou cast down from heaven? Uh, in the book of Revelation, chapter 19, uh, and I'll tell you, this opposer knows how to fit the pistol of the multitudes of society. Uh, he knows how to uh, fulfill that lust, uh, that, that uh, quick gratification. Uh, that's his business. And if you'll notice in Revelation chapter 19 and in verse 20, uh, it says, And the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet who are who in its presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur, and the rest were slain by the sword that came, that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse, and all the birds were gorged uh, on their flesh. Um, so we can see here in chapter 19 and in verse 20, the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet, who in its presence had done these signs. Um, he will be cast down. Jesus Christ will be exalted. Christ came to do his Father's will. Christ came to do his Father's will. And that is another mark that we need to watch, especially in Christianity, too. I want to apply this to the believer. Uh, we do have a nature uh, that is susceptible to these things. So in the book of John, chapter 6, and in verse 38, um, John, chapter 6, I'm sorry, verse 38, uh, if you'll notice, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whosoever comes to me I will in no wise cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up in the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Isn't that what our Lord Jesus Christ preached to Nicodemus? Look and live. Remember the serpent in the wilderness. What was the remedy for their sin? Look at the brazen serpent and live. You see, those that are doing the will of the Father are propagating the gospel of life. Look and live. They're pointing to Christ. Uh, they're going to do the will of God, the will of the Father. The Antichrist is out to do his own will. Uh, Daniel labels him the willful king. When someone is willful, that's not a person you want to follow. That is not a person you want to follow. Look in Daniel chapter 11, if you will, and in verse 36. And the king shall do as he wills. He shall exalt himself, there it is, and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak astonishing things against the god of gods. He shall prosper till the indignation is accomplished, for what is decreed shall be done. He shall pay no attention to the gods of his fathers or to the one beloved by women. He shall not pay attention to any other god, for he shall magnify himself. He shall honor the god of fortresses instead of these. Um, he's the war god. He is the willful king. 
Now we would be remiss not to remember the supplication in the garden. Abba, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. The true follower of Christ is interested in fulfilling the will of God, the will of the Father, the will of his Savior. And that will has been made clear in the Scriptures. He is not following his own will or the will of someone else. He is not magnifying himself or magnifying his way. Uh, that is opposition against God. And when I hear that a Christian is willful, there can be no worse testimony. That's going to lead to rebellion, and rebellion always leads to sin. Uh, this, this, this business of the battle of the wills, we call it sometimes, this ought not to be the character of the believer. Christ came to save. He came to seek and to save the lost. He brings salvation. In our own context, it says that this opposer is the son of destruction. Uh, destruction, the Antichrist, comes to destroy. That's brought out significantly in the book of Daniel while we're here. Chapter 8 and in verse 24. And it says, His power shall be great, but not by his own power. He shall cause fearful destruction and shall succeed in what he does and destroy mighty men and the people who are the saints. By his cunning, he shall make deceit prosper in his hand and in his own mind he shall become great. Without warning, he shall destroy many and he shall even rise up against the prince of princes and he shall be broken but not by no human hand. Um, he's out to destroy. Uh, that's why it says in the book of Romans, mark them who cause division or schism among you and uh, avoid them. Because that's bringing in disunity. It's bringing in destruction. And so uh, let's, uh, let's remember that contrast. Jesus Christ is the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Uh, our Lord is the good shepherd. Uh, the Antichrist is the idle or evil shepherd. Uh, in those books of um, in those books of Apocalypse, Old Testament Apocalypse, in the book of Zechariah chapter 11, if you'll turn with me there, the book of Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 11, and notice with me, if you will please, 11 verses 16 and 17. Uh, notice with me, if you will, please. I'll start in verse 15. Then the Lord said to me, Take once more the equipment of a foolish shepherd. For behold, I'm raising up in the land a shepherd who does not care for those being destroyed, or seek the young, or heal the maimed, or nourish the healthy, but devours the flesh for the fat ones, tearing off even their hooves. Woe to my worthless shepherd who deserts the flock. May the sword strike his arm and his right eye. Let his arm be wholly withered and his right eye utterly blinded. Okay, so we see that we see the evil shepherd and we see here the Lord and also in the book of Isaiah these worthless shepherds. And remember when Jesus came to uh, Jerusalem, to Israel, he saw uh, these shepherds where the sheep was scattered. Um, and they had no shepherd. Jesus Christ is the true vine. I am the true vine. And my father is the vine dresser. And when we go to the book of uh, Revelation, chapter 14, 18, um, we have a description of this opposer. And it is quite as usual, the opposite of our Lord Jesus Christ. And, and in the book of uh, Revelation 14, 18. Revelation 14 and in verse 18. I'll start in 17. 
Then another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he had two had a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, the, the angel who has authority over the fire, and he called with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle, Put in your sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, for its grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle across the earth and gathered the grape harvest of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. Um, Christ is the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And as we have studied in our uh, book, in the book of Second Thessalonians, we have studied that he is the one who is of the lie. He perpetrates the lie. Um, and that is something that we have to mark as believers. Our Lord Jesus Christ said of the Pharisees that he was a liar and never abode in the truth, uh, and therefore he was a murderer. Uh, and in Second uh, Thessalonians chapter 2, and in verse 11, Therefore God sends them a strong delusion, so that they may believe what is false, in order that they all may be condemned, who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. This lawless one, if you look in verse 9, the coming of the lawless one, who is by the activity of Satan with all power, false signs, wonders, and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing, because they refuse to love the truth, and so be saved. So we see who is at the head of that. Um, so uh, he is, the Antichrist is the lie. And we know that when Jesus Christ was dealing with his disciples, and may I say that, uh, don't think that we are above this. Remember in the book of Isaiah where God's people said, uh, let the Holy One depart from us. Uh, tell us lies. Tell us smooth things. Um, and that is the character of Antichrist. It's also the mark of apostasy. To compromise, to tolerate the lie. And so um, we do, please, uh, we do want to be those who understand the mystery of iniquity. It doth already work. Now look in John chapter 8, if you will, please. John chapter 8. Jesus is trying to deal with these with these um, Pharisees. Uh, you remember John 8 starts out with the woman caught in adultery, and our Lord manifests that he is the illuminator. I am the light of the world. And if you notice here in John 8, verse 39, they answered him, Abraham is our father. And Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me. A man who's told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You are doing the works of your father. Um, and they said to him, We are not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. And Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God and am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear or hear my word. You are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desire. Notice will. He was a murderer from the beginning. Destruction. Uh, he has nothing to do with the truth because there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe. Religious people refusing the truth. Believing the lie. So we need to be wise as serpents, harmless as doves, as the Lord Jesus Christ told us. Jesus Christ is the Holy One. And the Antichrist is the Lawless One. Um, we could turn to the book of Mark uh, chapter. Uh, we'll look at Mark here. I think we're in the beginning of Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, the Holy One has come. Mark chapter 1, and in verse 24. Mark chapter 1, verse 24. What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? 
Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Uh, but this is the lawless one. There is the Holy One. There is the lawless one. Christ is the man of sorrows, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Isaiah 53, uh, 53 uh, 3. The Antichrist is the man of sin. We just read that just a moment ago. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. The Antichrist is the Son of perdition. In the book of Luke chapter 1, the book of Luke chapter 1, and in verse 35, if you'll notice please, the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be, ca will be called holy, the Son of God. And we've noticed that it is the son of perdition that is the description of the Antichrist, the opposer. Christ is the mystery of godliness. God manifest in the flesh. The Antichrist is the mystery of iniquity. Will be Satan manifest in the flesh, and I do believe that. In the book of 1 Timothy chapter 3 and in verse 16. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and in verse 16. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and in verse 16. I'm going to start here in verse 14. I hope to come to you soon, but I am I'm writing these things to you so that if I delay, ye may know how one ought to behave himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the word, world taken up in the glory. And in the book of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7, this opposer, is described as the mystery of iniquity. I hope that you have appreciated this teaching. I know that we have been a little bit parted, and this time I have too much light on me, as opposed to the darkness last time. But it is a pleasure to give this message to you out of 2 Thessalonians. I know that not everybody got that message at one point because we were having technical difficulties but I, I, do, I do want you to have this teaching, and I think there's a lot of practical application. Um, how dare we fall into some of these characterizations even in our uh, practical life, such as pride, a haughtiness, willfulness, um, speaking even blasphemous things, things that are not godly, um, not, not adhering, abiding, and listening to the truth. So I hope that you will take this as practical application. Paul wanted the Thessalonians to do so uh, because he, he told them the mystery of iniquity doth already work. And let us understand that Satan would like nothing more than these characterizations to be put in, to be present in the church. When we see those things, we need to address those things, even with our brethren. Uh, and we need to be good about calling them down on it. Uh, this is why we assemble one with another. Uh, there are some people that are showing tremendous willfulness sometimes in churches, uh, wanting their own way, and those kinds of things. When we see that, you need to mark that. That's the spirit of Antichrist. That's the mystery of iniquity already working. How so we ought to be those who walk in the truth. Uh, John said, I have no greater joy than that my children walk in the truth. Well, I'd like to leave you with this teaching and praise God for who he is. We thank God for Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life.